just me today. So um, this is actually a background from UVA. It's just a nice little cozy corner with a couple of chairs. It's kind of like us just kind of sitting around having a nice little chat about Surefoot. I'm just going to get my water organized so I don't spill it. Um, hi, Marian. Marian, have you been to every webinar I have done? I, your name comes up so often. I think I'm trying to figure out who's my, you know, uh, um, who's attended the most live webinars and, and um, almost. <laughs> it's great. It's really great. Um, I'll just give everybody a minute. Hi, Annalie. Um, hi, Deb. Melody's another one. Melody, how many of these webinars have you attended live? Because um, uh, I've seen your name quite often. It's, uh, it's great. And Anna. So it's, it's really fun. It's like I've got, you know, this uh, group of close friends, even though some of you I've never met. Um, so um, I think I'll just go ahead and get started. And if more people join in, that's great. Hi, I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is webinar number 62. I've been doing these webinars during the pandemic um, to educate people and keep you entertained and give you something to think about. Uh, the webinars have taken on a life of their own. It's amazing um, how far reaching they are and how many incredible comments and support. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Bellini, who helped me out last night because Dr. Riley was a little late, um, Dr. Bellini's been getting calls from veterinarians asking her about surefoot pads, which is just fantastic. Um, so I know that these webinars are going out far and wide, and um, my goal is to just help uh, educate people to the possibilities of change. Um, if we don't know that something exists, we can't do anything about it. So through these webinars, I interview a variety of guests um, and then talk about Surefoot and how Surefoot can be a vehicle for change. Um, today, what I thought I'd do, actually, I'm, I'm going to just set up a little Facebook Live here. So that'll take me a moment. Uh, page. Uh, equine. I thought we'd talk about pods today. I know we've touched on it a little bit, but um, I've had some questions about it. And then if there's anything that you want me to talk about, just put it in the chat or put it in the q and I'll take a look and I'm happy to um, discuss whatever you're interested in, in, in regards to Surefoot. Okay. Do, do, do. Okay, we're going to go live. Great. And I'll just check it on my phone. Oh, oh, bear loves pods. Yeah, you know, and pods are really interesting because there are some horses that um, they're so-so about pads and then you put them on the pods and they are just like, oh yeah, we're good. We're, they're all over it. And um, it's, it's not something I offer first. So let me just kind of describe it a little bit. Um, and I'll be showing lots of images, so don't worry. Um, so uh, the Surefoot pads are the 10 by 12 rectangular pads and they come in densities from hard, firm, medium, and soft, and two styles, hard slants and firm slants. And then we have what's called physio pads, which are thinner, they're an inch and a half thick, and they're made of two different uh, materials. They're made of an inch of hard and a half inch of medium. And the, the physio pads are fabulous for, uh, you know, if you have a horse that you're at all concerned about, to introduce them to the whole concept. Um, they're great if you're a farrier or a barefoot trimmer and you want to make the horse more comfortable while you're working. We have so many reports of horses being um, more comfortable and able to be worked on using the physio pad and many, many horses that don't need to be drugged anymore to have their feet done. Um, so that's the physio pads. And we've talked about that in other webinars. Um, when the horse is accustomed to, to uh, being offered surefoot pads, which are 10 by 12, then we can go to pods. Pods are seven and a half inch air-filled domes. And the reason the horse needs to be accustomed to the pads is because you have to kind of place the foot a little more specifically onto the pod. Um, and so having them be comfortable standing on pads 
understanding what you're doing, knowing that they have a choice, those are all prerequisites to starting with um, pods. So, uh, and this is a question that was asked the other day. I'm gonna answer this first before I go to pods. Um, the number one question I am asked about Surefoot is which pad should I start with? So it's, it's actually pretty simple. If we're gonna talk about the rectangular pads, the 10 by 12 by two, you basically have two choices for starting, hard or firm. And the reason for that is that if you offer the horse too much instability too soon before they understand what you're doing and what this is all about, they could actually become anxious. And we're actually trying to offer them grounding and calmness. If you have a horse that is nervous, anxious, weak, um, has been uh, learned to pull back, um, tends to brace, you want to start with hard. And the reason for that is that hard is going to give directly to heat and pressure with no lateral give. So in other words, the foot's going to come down on the pad and okay, now it's when, oops, oh, I just lost you all. Hang on. I'm going to see if I can't go and um, just quickly uh, go over to my photos and grab a picture of hard. So you can see what I'm talking. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, and I'll just do a screen share. Do a screen share. There we go. Okay. Here's the hard pad. It's given to heat and pressure. And what you can see is that it's just going to give directly. It's the same on both sides. So you can flip it over and use the other side. I like to do that when I want to kind of see how the horse is loading that foot. Um, so I'll stand them on one side and then it will return back to perfectly flat, but it will take time depending on how warm it is. So if it's a cooler day, I just flip it over to the uncolored side, the ivory side, and I do it again so that I have another impression that's, I think of it as clean. Um, because what'll happen sometimes is if they step off, I don't know that I have a quick one that I can get to with it. Oh, well, you can see it here, right? Here's the second image of where the foot landed. So you've got the first one, right? And then you've got this other one. And so if they pick up their foot and move it a little sideways and step back down again, you don't get a, a super clean uh, print. And that's, these are all examples of a horse standing on hard. Here he is standing on four hard pads. Um, I was just looking at the, um, the uh, imprint of his feet because what I'm working on is seeing, can I correlate the measurements of the foot to the measurements of the imprint on the pad so that if you have a horse that you can't really hold up his leg long enough to take a measurement of his foot, as Bob Bowker tells us to do, then we can measure that by measuring the pad. The one thing that you have to realize is, let me get back to that single print. There was a better one. There we go. Um, when we're looking at a single print, what you can see is there's this edge where the pad has, you know, folded in a little bit. And so what I'm trying to work out is uh, where do you measure to, right? That's always the question. But basically you can see here that you've got, you can measure across and you can measure the length. And then we can see this is the back of the frog here. And then it, um, and th th what's really interesting about this picture, of course, is that this is actually impressed and this, the, the lateral sulcus is not impressed, but this picture looks the opposite. It looks like we're looking at the bottom of a foot if you pick it up and here's your lateral sulcus and here's your frog. Um, but actually the, this area is raised and this area is depressed. Um, and that's one of the really fascinating things about photographing um, the, the impression. And sometimes I can get it, yep. So now that I shrunk it, it flipped for me. This is now raised and this is now impressed. And so, you know, and so now it works. That's how I see it now. And it's an optical illusion. It's, <laughs> um, I can, sometimes I can make the image flip. I've gotten better at it. Sometimes I can't. Um, but basically hard pad, it's going to give to heat and pressure, no lateral give. Um, it gives slowly. Um, it's not a rapid change because it is a really stiff material. Um, it is softer in warm weather, harder in cold weather, still works. I've used it at 22 degrees Fahrenheit with an Icelandic was only about 900 pounds. Had the same result I have with 
you know, other horses. And the only difference is that the impression is going to disappear faster when the pad is warm and slower when it's cold. So if it's a hot day, um, you can chuck it in the freezer. You, you can keep it in your air conditioned car if you don't want the impression to go away too fast. Um, will not hurt it to freeze this pad, won't really freeze. Um, and if it's a cold day, it's going to take longer for the impression to go away. So if you wanted to do it again, you might want to flip it over because you have to wait a little longer. But then you can just warm it up, throw it in your warm car or warm room, it's going to return. So it always returns to looking like the original pad um, in terms of the flat surface. Um, so, so when you have a horse that has any kind of issue, nervous, anxious, weak, uh, recovering from an injury, do the other legs with this pad. You know, don't do the injured leg unless you have approval of a veterinarian. Make sure you have a good diagnosis. Um, it's it's a great pad, and I really um, I like it a lot. Um, if the horse is basically calm, you can start with firm. Firm's going to have lateral give, uh, but you know that basically calm is the key here. And horses that are dragging their feet or kind of look at things, those are not calm. So when in doubt, you start harder and then work down through the system because as you move down, you're increasing the instability. So if a horse is nervous and you start with something really squishy, it freaks them out um, because the surface gave and especially with your Mustangs um, and your Arabs who are very foot aware. Um, and if you have large horses like draft horses or really big warm bloods, you know, hard is definitely where you want to start, even if they're really calm. Um, just from the weight factor, the pads really are not weight dependent in that way. You can put a tiny little pony and a big monster horse onto the hard pad. But um, we find with some of the 19 hand uh, drafts that they kind of um, squish the firm a fair amount. <laughs> and so, you know, that's where using hard is really good. Okay. Um, we've been, I'm just gonna, there's a question here. We've been working with a gelding for about six weeks on the pads. He has slants and regular firm. For the most part, his new pre-ride involves three to five minutes front and back feet before most rides, and he doesn't want to get off. Oh, <laughs> how long should he stay on? So if you've been working with your horse for about six weeks now, he's used to the pads and you can leave him for a longer period. I would say just gradually increase the duration like increase it like by about a minute um or you know a couple of sessions and then another minute uh, we have horses that don't want to get off um we have horses that have um literally stayed on the pads for an hour um and in the beginning that's really not advised for many reasons but one is because you're working the little tiny postural muscles and you can make horses sore using surefoot uh, my my illustration of that is you know, you go to the gym, you've been sitting in home because of COVID, you haven't been exercising, you go to the gym and you think you're going to do the same exercises you did before COVID and you work out and then you go home and you go the next day, you're like, wow, I'm really sore. You know, what did I do? Well, you worked out. Or the other example is that you start a new exercise program, even though you're really fit in the previous one. And sorry, I'm just taking off my shoes. Um, and you're using new muscles, muscles that you haven't used in the previous program. And again, two days later, wow, I'm really sore. We want to avoid soreness. Um, horses, you can't tell a horse, the reason you're sore is that you stood in the pads too long two days ago. Um, they don't have that thought process, that ability. So that's where I always say we have to be a good parent and recognize that when we're starting out and, and the length of the duration is really important in the beginning, because we don't know how the horse is gonna respond. So when you're starting out, keeping it short. And I, I always remind people that the very first horse I ever put on a pad, I timed it for 15 seconds and the horse went from appearing lame to sound in 15 seconds. So, um, but there are a lot of horses that they get on and they don't wanna get off. So if your horse has been working with the pads for about six weeks and he's up to about five minutes, then I would say gradually increase the duration and see what he really chooses. Um, you, you might be surprised. It might be just a little bit longer or it might be a lot longer. And again, just remember, the more sway you see, right, rocking and swaying, then you want to think, okay, this horse could be sore the next day because he's really using different muscles. Let's take him off today 
and we can always do it again. So that's just a, you know, a, just a good rule of thumb. I would call it common sense uh, to just, when we're ever questioning how long, we have to just refer back to ourselves and think about, okay, this is me starting a new exercise program, or this is me learning to stand, and this is actually something that you all might wanna do, is stand on your pad on one foot. So take off your shoes, step on a sure foot pad, and then just stand out on one foot and see what happens and see how stable you are or unstable you are and how long do you want to stay there? And can you increase the duration of being able to stand one-legged on a pad? And that will give you some idea of what some of these horses are going through in terms of how they have to adjust their balance, how they have to adapt, what muscles they're working, um, and how long you're capable of standing on one foot on a pad. Okay, so just relating it back to yourself is always a great way. I hope all of you are using your surefoot pads for you, whether that's if you're holding the horse for the farrier or um, we've had situations where um, in therapeutic riding, um, they had a, a little boy who had a lot of difficulty mounting. And so they just put him on the surefoot pads and had him stand there for a couple of minutes and it totally changed the ease in mounting. So, you know, it's a great thing to do for you. If you're nervous or anxious while you're working with your horse, stand on a pair of pads. Um, we actually have um, been working toward bringing our pads into the human market because unlike other things that are available for stability training in humans, you can wear any kind of shoe you want on surefoot pads. So, you know, um, if you're an athlete, you really wanna chain, change in, train in your footwear that you're going to use to perform. It's like showing, you know, wearing your half chaps and short boots and then showing in your tall boots. It's really different. So you want to practice wearing your tall boots so that when you go in the arena, you're familiar with your tall boots. Well, it's the same thing in terms of uh, practicing stability training um, in barefoot versus in your foot gear. And so with surefoot pads, you can wear any of the foot gear that for your appropriate sport, whether that's your riding boots, whether that's you know, ball cleats or tennis shoes um, so that you are training within the parameters of your sport. Um, I have another question here. My 15 year old Arab gelding has been standing on my physio pad for about 10 to 15 minutes. He blinks, licks, and his knees will start to buckle forward. Shall I ask him to get off? Yeah, yeah, definitely ask him to get off before he falls off. Um, and if his knees are buckling, it sounds like he's going really quite deep. Um, almost falling asleep. So yeah, I would definitely decrease that duration and move him off before that starts to happen. Um, I've, uh, I've had one instance where a horse fell down. Um, it only happened once. It happened in front of Linda Tellington Jones with 20 people there when I was doing a little demo for her. Uh, the horse was not mounted. Um, he Yep, he laid down and slept for about five minutes. I thought I'd killed my first horse with Surefoot. Um, and Martina Neerhart talks about it in her webinar. I would recommend that you watch that one, that you want to watch the breathing as Marion suggested, and also the pulse rate, which you can see in the jugular because the neck muscles will relax enough that you can actually count it. But if you see a change in breathing where the pattern starts to get more stressful, that is bad. Um, now you're switching systems. So um, I would just say decrease your duration um, and, and you know, don't wait for him to get to that point. Um, there are some horses that you'll watch while they're on pads and they look like they're starting to walk. They'll, you know, move one leg and then sway over and move the other leg and they'll just kind of go back and forth like that. Um, but that sounds different than what you're talking about. Um, let's see, I have a question from someone else here. I wrote you about uh, my bear stepping off pads, pods, and then not wanting to move. Still processing was my guess, so waiting a bit before asking him to walk. No wrong answers. Yeah. Um, yes, this is true. Like, while we recommend that you move the horse after being on the pads, let me explain the reason for that. Um, horses are movement-based creatures. Um, if you listen to um, Dr. Stephen Peter's webinars, you know, it becomes very apparent how their brain functions and that they're motor-based creatures. So the, the purpose of the movement after being on the pad is so that they integrate the new feelings and sensations of grounding and proprioception into movement because they're movement-based creatures. However, some horses don't wanna move immediately after being on the pads. 
Um, some horses, uh, if your horse is really sore, laminitic, um, not feeling well, that kind of thing, they might just step off the pads and just want to stand. And that's okay. So while you know, we encourage the horse to move, we obviously have to listen to the individual horse. And there's a lot of horses that'll come off the pads and you can see that they're still really processing. You can see by their eyes, they're really dreamy and they're internal, their ears are just listening inside and they're, um, they're just still processing the information. And so, you know, again, I go back to people um, I'm very quick and, and people are always telling me to, you know, I'm always jumping in. I always think I have the answer and it's like, it's this, isn't it? You know, it's like, I, I've done it all my life. Um, I, I've had people, you know, just tell me that I think too fast. Um, <laughs> and so that's, you know, that's me. Um, and so I'm, I'm this sort of rapid bunny when it comes to like jumping ahead on the storyline. And then um, other people like Brad, my guy, are much more methodical and he's an engineer and he builds things in his head and he ponders and he looks and he thinks and it makes me crazy because I'm the quick rabbit. And so he'll be processing and thinking and it's like nothing's happening. And then finally, you know, a week later or two weeks later or a month later, he'll go, okay, now I've got it and this is how we're gonna do it. Um, and in the meantime, I'm just ripping out my fingernails because it, I feel like nothing's happening. Um, and so with horses, we see the same thing. Some horses are very rapid processors. Other horses are much more methodical. Um, they need more time. Um, your draft and draft crosses are a lot that way. I have a draft cross. He's earth. Food is extremely important to Al. Um, and he ponders things and it takes more time to, pro but once he gets it, it's, he's got it. And he spends time in the field processing and thinking about, like if I, uh, was working on say counter canner and then I went away on a trip for six weeks and I came back the first thing he wanted to offer me was counter canner because he'd been thinking about it the whole time he was in the field and that you could feel sitting on it and so the same thing with surefoot some of these horses are going to process really rapidly and other horses are going to be a little more suspicious or a little more skeptical um, and then other horses are just going to be more methodical and they're going to think you know, oh wait, they've come off the pads and you can see them just needing a moment. It might even be a couple of minutes, just needing to stand there and just kind of take a deep breath, kind of absorb the information that they just received and then move. So, you know, almost everything I tell you about Surefoot is as Robin Hood says, written in sand. They're guidelines. We have a couple of rules that are not written in sand, they're written in something a lot more strong. And that is keep your hand away from the hoof when you're placing the pad, because you know we're working with unstable surfaces. And if the horse is unstable and you're going to put a pad and your hand's down there, you're, you could get in trouble, you could get stepped on. So safety is always our greatest concern for horse and person. Okay, that's number one. And also when you're bending over and you're that far down, if something happens and the horse startles, you're vulnerable. So by using your foot, keeping one hand on your back, picking up the leg with the other hand, kicking the foot into place with your foot, you're more upright. So you're less vulnerable. You're more able to move away quickly if you need to. Your hands are safe. And then the other rule is, is really listen to your horse. Um, they get a voice in all of this. They get to reject it outright. We have some horses that do that. They get to, um, you know, if they don't want to stay on it, that's fine. Um, and it will challenge you. You'll find how ingrained some habits are that we have to horses. Um, I've watched people and, you know, they're like, to pick up your foot, pick up your foot, be good, pick up your foot. <laughs> you know, clucking and everything, trying to, when I'm asking the horse to pick up a foot and the horse isn't picking up the foot and the owner's so invested in the horse being good that they're, that that's their greatest concern that the horse picks up the foot. But I'm assessing and observing and I love David's, um, sorry, Dennis's webinar the other day, if you haven't seen it about observing, that you have seeing, looking and observing. And when I'm picking up a foot, I'm observing. Does he pick up the foot? 
Does he lean onto it? Does he only bend the knee? Does he only bend the fetlock? Does the foot come up off the ground six inches, two inches, a half an inch? Does he push the leg forward or back? And all of that is information that I'm gathering about this horse. So we're, we're asking him to do something different and something new. And if the first thing he does is brace the leg, then that gives me a clue about how this horse is gonna react to different circumstances. You know, if he stands there and he just freely gives me the leg and I can lift it up easily and place it down, that gives me other information about this horse. So I'm always observing what the horse is doing in response to my request, as opposed to just picking up a leg. And the more we can become observers, and I loved what Dennis talked about with observing. He talked about the confusion that um, I, brain, 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 I, brain, 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 I, you know, clunk, oh, got it, right? That it's not this see it to the brain and back kind of a thing. It's confusion. He talked about that, that's okay. And a lot of people at first, I get emails all the time that they're rather confused about, well, what do I do? Well, I'm not there. I don't know what your horse did. So I can give you guidelines. I can say, this is the general program that you offer it to the horse and you pick up the foot and you place it on a pad and you let him walk off if he wants to. And that's the general rule. Because if he walks off, he's unbalanced anyway. And that's what we're here to learn. So um, if we're trying to hold him and make him stand on a pad, that's really not what we're doing because now we're back to training or insisting. And we're really asking this question of how balanced are you? What do you do when you stand on an unstable surface? Do you fall off? Do you have to move forward? Do you go sideways? Is your leg stiff or soft or light or heavy when you, I pick it up? Do you push it back or pull it forward? Does the foot not go down where it came from when I picked it up? And these are all the things that I observe when I'm asking a horse to stand on a pad, not just simply getting him on a pad. So, um, you know, it's okay knowing your horse, if he wants to stand there for a couple more minutes, it's totally okay because that's what your horse needs. Um, and then if he wants to go for a walk, great. What we're trying to avoid is that, um, we're trying to avoid with that take them for a walk is making them stand on the pads. And the other thing is giving them a chance to integrate in movement, to integrate that piece of information and figure out what does that mean to me, me being the horse, what does that mean to me as I move now? And I can tell you from having sat on horses where someone else placed the pads under their feet, that when they walk off, their brain is really paying attention to what that foot is doing. It's like you can almost feel them go foot, ground, foot, ground, ground, oh, oh, that's different, right? You can literally feel them consciously becoming aware of how their foot is landing. And some horses, while they're processing, go at just, just crawling, just barely moving. Like, it's so weird to them. They're like, well, I don't know, my foot's, I don't know, what's it doing, right? And other horses are like, this is cool. And they just march off. And then the next thing is they're extending their trot. Um, you know, there's nice big walk. But other horses are cautious. And they walk off and they go, wow, this is weird. I'm paying it to, oh, wow, what is that? Wow. And then they start to move out. So it's, it's about offering them the opportunity to integrate the information. That's really what the walk afterward is about. Okay, I've got another question here. This is awesome. Um, let's see, can you use the pads as part of a ride? Absolutely. If so, how does it work? This particular horse is an Arab who can learn relaxation under saddle, who could learn. He's not reactive to normal external stimuli, just discomfort, question mark, under saddle. Vet has been over him, says he's fine, and he has a great vet. I'm tough on vets. He might have been flipped, oh, over while schooling in a main ring halter frequently when the car works on him his pelvis is an issue. Okay, perfect question for how to employ surefoot during a ride. So with this horse in particular, the first thing I would do after I know that he's been on pads is I go into that main arena or that arena where you know that he starts to get nervous or anxious and I would start with the pads there. So we want to take the place where something may have happened that was not so positive and change into something that's really good. And I've had many, many horses where, you know, there's a corner of the arena that they're really spooky, 
And so I start away from that corner and I use the pads and they start to let down and they start to get familiar with the pads and pretty soon they're like humming away and they're really enjoying it and they're, you know, swaying or whatever. And then I move closer to the area of anxiety. Now that could be a horse trailer, that could be the corner of an arena, that could be a mounting block, um, any, any place where something may have happened in the past that now they have a bit of PTSD. And just like people, if you like, there's a, there's, it's not such a pleasant story, but long story short, my horse wound up with bacterial enteritis and I put her in the horse trailer to take her to the vet clinic and I stopped at an intersection to check on her and she'd fallen down in the trailer and she slithered out onto the road and she, we got her off the road, but she died on the side of the road at this intersection, which happens to be one of the major intersections in my area that we go through. And so, of course, every time I go through that intersection, I think of my horse that died on the side of the road. Um, and so horses have place neurons and they have recognition of something happened here or this looks familiar like someone with PTSD. And if the horse has been flipped, I'm sure he has a bit of PTSD. You know, the memory, um, the amygdala fires with the hippocampus to get a little deep here. And you, it's like this weld and you've wired together this anxiety and emotion with a memory. And what we want to do is unwire that. We want to uncouple the memory from the emotion. And so to do that, we have to offer something different. We have to change the situation and offer something positive so that now the brain has a choice. And so I would, if it was me, I would go near the area, not to the place where the highest anxiety, in other words, you don't want to push them all the way to the top. You want to work with them and get them accustomed to the pads where you know that they are enjoying it away from that anxious place. And then I go toward it till, you know, if I see them get a little worried or a little bit tense or a little bit like I want out of here, then maybe back off a little from that moment, you know, come back a little and then use the pads again and say, how about some comfort? How would you feel about that? And what you'll see is the horse will let down again. They have to make a choice. They have to choose calmness over anxiety. And fortunately, their nervous system is designed for that. It's designed to seek ease. It's designed to come back into homeostasis. Homeostasis is the place where the internal systems are, at, are calm right? Um, the example would be you sitting on the couch with a bag of popcorn, watching a really good movie. You're calm and you're at peace with yourself. And so the horses are designed to come back into homeostasis. And so I offer the pads and I say, look, this spot's good too. Look, it feels great. And the horse comes down and then I might take them away again and repeat. So I'll move them toward the place of anxiety and offer them the pads and give them a choice of calming themselves. And what you'll see in the horses is they'll learn how to throw the parasympathetic switch. They'll learn how to throw the rest and digest switch, the coming down, instead of the going up. And this is where I talk about toggling, that I think the pads toggle the sympathetic, the autonomic nervous system, which is the sympathetic parasympathetic. Um, and if you watch Violet Van He's webinars on vagal nerve, um, she talks a lot about that, that we need some sympathetic, like if I'm going to get off the couch, I need some sympathetic to get off the couch. But I want to live in this nice little um, sine wave, if you will, of sympathetic parasympathetic so that I can take an action, I can get up off the couch and go to the refrigerator, and then I come back down to sitting on the couch watching my movie. Um, if I get out of that, I go above that, I'm in sympathetic anxiety, fight, flight. And so when we move toward a place of PTSD, of where we've wired this emotion together with this memory, we need to help the nervous system downregulate. We need to help it learn how to throw the parasympathetic switch and go, all is well. And they need to feel safe. And so we've already developed the bond of safeness, safety, by using the pads with the horse away from that anxious place. So the, it's amazing, and this is one of the things I love about Surefoot, is how quickly horses go, oh, you're a safe person. You've listened to me. You've made me feel better. I want to be with you because you make me feel safe. Not run you over, but be with me. And so then I can move toward the place of anxiety. I offer the pad again, and I toggle them. Right? They go, they've gone up a little bit, and we go back down. 
right? And they learn, oh, I can find calmness. I can find ease. I can switch myself back down. Then I might give it a rest for that day, or I might go a little closer to the eight place of anxiety. It's really at this point reading the horse to see, you know, it, has he had enough? Is he still with me? Can I go a little closer? And I toggle again. And horses literally learn how to throw the parasympathetic switch, how to calm themselves down. And that's one of the, the tools or skills that we want the horse to learn from Surefoot is how to downregulate, how to go, all is well, I am safe, I am secure, I can evaluate what that is, it's nothing, nothing to worry about, or the circumstances that happened before aren't gonna happen. You are a safe person to be with, you are bringing me comfort. And these are all the things that happen on an emotional level with horses, aside from all of the other proprioceptive changes. So, um, I, I mean, I've had so many horses where I've done this with horses where I just take them into the, you know, get them familiar with the pads, take them a little into the anxiety. How long it's going to take your horse to be able to maintain that, I can't tell you. Um, I've seen some horses one session and they're like, I'm fine. Everything's cool. Um, I've had another horse, a little Pasofino, his name is Snip. Um, he had an injury that was unrecognized as a foal, probably broken ribs, then went to a bad trainer. Um, he's still, um, he's so improved. But she wound up having to use the pads with him every single day. And mounting was a drama. And so then she not only used the pads, but she found out that the mounting block she was using actually was a trigger. And she started using a different mounting block. And that really helped. But the pads were involved in the process of determining that one of the triggers was this particular mounting block. And that's, you know, it's so much about being a detective and then having some tools where we can say, oh, wow, well, he, you know, he's calmer here, but then I did this and he got more anxious. Is it this thing or is it, you know, something he heard or smelled? Their sense of hearing and smell is huge. Um, and we really have to play detective to sort it out. But Snip over the past three, four years has made huge changes. He, I mean, it's huge. I can't, I can't even be, I should have her on as a guest just to talk about Snip. Huge changes. And so that's exactly how I address the horses where, you know, if the horse has been flipped, he's going to have memory and he's going to have anxiety and there's going to be triggers, anything that relates back to the circumstances. Um, so if you've, like for me, it's going past that corner where my mayor died. Um, for you, I'm sure that there's somewhere that you saw something happen where you wired in this anxiety with the memory. And so we've got to change the, we've got to offer a way to downregulate, to let go of it, and to uncouple the emotion from the experience. Um, let's see, but this horse is not just a place as much as weight on his back. Well, so... If it's weight on his back, then, you know, and, and you've done all the things to assess that his back is okay, I would highly recommend the Tellington Jones, the T-Touch, in combination with the pads, in combination with um, working with the tack. So it's really about breaking it down and um, figuring out, is it, is it the weight or is it the foot in the stirrup? I mean, there's a lot of horses, they feel your foot in the stirrup and that's already sent them up, even though you haven't gotten on. So it, you, it's really about breaking it down and figuring out what are the elements so that you're only dealing with a piece, not the whole thing, and then um, working from there. But you know, using Surefoot Under Saddle, we've had so many horses that have uh, been, if you will, allergic to their tack, um, anxious about their tack, anxious about being ridden. And I always tell people, what do you like when you visit your mother? And what do you like when you visit your friends? Now, if you have a great relationship with your mother, this won't make sense. But most of us have something with our mom. And so, you know, we're different with our mom. And then when we're with our friends, we're more relaxed. And so as soon as we put the tack on the horse or we go into the arena or we go into the environment where something happened, they change. And we cannot address that habit unless we're in that environment. In other words, Having your horse in the stall and giving them a great massage is not going to solve the habit of anxiety in the arena because he's in a stall where he feels safe and it's not where the actual situation happened. And so we really have to start to um, 
be better observers and notice, is it when I approach, if it's, if you're walk, walking up to the mounting block and he's already starting to get stiff legged, that's the place to use the sure foot pads. Anywhere you want to switch the mindset, anywhere you want to say, oh, you're getting worried, ah, chill out. And so it's really going to be up to you to pay a bit of attention. Hi, Sybil. And, um, and really look at breaking down the circumstances. And um, it might even be helpful for you to have someone video and then go back and watch the video in slow motion and s figure out, is it as I approach the arena? Is it when I approach the mounting block? Is it when I put my foot in the stirrup? Is it when I swing my leg over? And um, starting to break down exactly where the circumstances are, but then also breaking down it even in the positive, like, oh, he's okay walking in the arena. Sure, no problem. Use a short foot pad there, get the relaxation, then walk him forward to the mounting block. He's okay there, doesn't matter. Use the short foot pad, remind him, hey, this is what we're doing. We're doing relaxation, right? Stand up on the mounting block, head comes up a little bit. You know, so have someone on the ground, use the pad or get off and put the horse on the pad. Remind him of relaxation. Walk him away from the mounting block and return. Is he nervous? Is he calm? use the pad again. So it's, it's this constantly saying, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay. And just reminding the system, reminding the horse that he can let down, that he has choice, that he can calm himself. And um, fortunately, fortunately, horses don't have the capacity of the frontal lobe that people do. Because in teaching riding lessons, I'll get someone who's been like rigid and stiff in the shoulders and sitting really upright because they thought they're supposed to and they can't breathe and getting them to soften the chest. And then they snap, I can't do that. That's not right. I'm like, why isn't it right? Your horse just went better because that's not what I should do. And it's like, but your horse went better, but I can't do that. And it's like, really? Well, that's frontal lobe, that's self-image. That's our frontal lobe getting in the way of progress. And the beauty of the horse is he doesn't have that. He can't go, oh, that's not right. That's not what I should do. You know, it's if it feels better, he's going to go for feeling better. So, um, so it, you know, this is the thing that it's so much about being there in the moment, being present. And I, I get questions all the time from people, what pad should I use and what should I do? And I'm like, just get started. Listen to your horse. I'm not there. So I can't observe the things that I would observe that would tell me what to do. You are there. You're present with your horse. The most important thing is to be present with your horse, not to be chitter chattering with your friends, not be on your phone, you know, be really present and observe, which means possible confusion, right? If we think about Dennis's webinar, that it's not just looking or seeing, it's that you know, taking in data points and then going, well, what does that mean? How does that, how do I relate to that? Um, videoing, you know, just take a little video of how the horse is standing on the pad or a photograph um, and notice how he's standing on the pad. I think of, and I'm, I'm gonna screen share here again. Uh, and actually, you know what I'm gonna do? <laughs> I'm gonna pull up, a, I'm gonna see if I can find a quick picture of a foot because I always think about looking at the foot. And I know I said I'd talk about pods, <laughs> so I will. Um, but when I look at the foot, I think about a clock. And I, I evaluate, let's see, where the heck am I going here? Uh, yeah. Let's see if this, I just need a picture of a foot. No, that's not it. Uh, Oh, here, I'll just go over to my photos and I, maybe I can draw on them to do, do, do screen share. Yeah, I can, we'll just use this one. Um, so I always think about 12 o'clock being to the toe and six o'clock being to the heel, three o'clock right, nine o'clock left. And so when I look at an image, I go, okay, and this has a shadow on it. So it's a little bit deceiving because of the lighting. We can see a shadow here. You know, if it's like, do I see the horse standing there with more pressure on this portion of his foot? Um, do I see the leg? Let me see if I can switch to another picture. Okay, 
need to rotate that. Uh, maybe I just did like look forward here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, are you uh, seeing a horse standing on two green pads? If anybody's not seeing that, let me know. Um, so here, if I kind of zoom in a little bit and we look at this right front, we can see that this is actually looking pretty even in terms of the load. You know, the foot isn't perfectly trimmed, um, but you know, we can see that this wall's a little bit longer than this one. But if you look here along the toe, you can see that that's pretty even. But if we come over to this foot, it becomes really apparent that 12 o'clock is straight ahead, one to two, it looks like there's greater pressure on the medial side, right? And so this is gonna give us a clue. And then other things I look at, um, <laughs> I know her, um, here's the point of her shoulder. And if I was to drop a plumb line down, and it's a little bit of an odd picture, but I'm just grabbing any picture right now, right? But if I drop a plumb line down, her leg looks very much toward midline, not underneath the shoulder. So, oh, that's better. Let's see if I can go back. Okay, so now, and this is a little video, and I'll just let it play for a second. If we look, we can see here's the point of her shoulder and here's her leg. So now her leg looks much more underneath of her, right? But what we notice is, look, her head is organized over this right front foot. And she's swaying a little bit, but you can see, I mean, here you can see her chest line and here's her head clearly over her right front foot. And she's not being held, she could put her head anywhere she wants. So this is a big clue in terms of how is my horse organizing and what is that gonna mean to me in movement? Well, if she's always keeping her head over this foot, then when we turn to the right, she'll probably fall in a little bit. And when we go to turn to the left, we'll be pulling on that left rein, trying to get her to come around the turn, but she's kind of drifting out. And there we can see now she's changed her head position and she shifted her weight. And now there's more weight on her left front and less on her right. And we've seen now how this, the weight bearing on this foot has changed a little bit. She's more to the inside of this foot. And then when she turns her head, we can see here's her rib cage bulging. She turns her head way over, but her sternal line stayed quite straight, meaning she didn't rotate her rib cage, but she did side bend and we saw the rib cage bulge out on the left. Right? And when she turns her head the other way, it's very different. She leaned on this left front, and I saw the FedEx man just walk toward my door. Yeah. Hang on a second. Hello? Oops. I'm on a webinar. Hang on. I'll be right back. Nobody else is home. <laughs> Hi. Okay, I'm back. Oh, and I just spilled my water. Okay, I'll that later. All right, when you're all by yourself, you never know what's going to happen. Um, so a foot in a pelvic clock. Yes, we actually, I have an image that's going to be in the workbook. I'm working diligently to create the Surefoot workbook. Um, that's my homework this, this, the rest of this month. And we're going to have a foot clock to help you really be able to tell where the load is by marking on your foot clock. All right, so let me end that screen share. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I'm hoping to have this uh, workbook done soon. Um, it's been a work in progress, but let's talk about pods because I did say we're gonna do that. So let me pull up my pods um, folder. All right, so the we kind of got here because um, let's escape. Now I got to get back to screen share. Screen share. There we go. So. Um, the pods, and you can see here, they're the, the, she's standing on two pods, and this is a horse that we did pads, and we were doing a little research project. Sadly, that data has never been analyzed. Um, this was with Dr. Clayton, and we had two horses, and you can see the little shiny reflections. So she, we had kinematic dots on her, 
So we were looking at the outline of the horse and she was standing on force plates, one under each foot. And we were looking at whether or not the distribution of her weight would change and what was happening with the kinematics. In other words, the outline of the horse. Um, and the fascinating thing for everyone was that the door was over here to the left. And typically when they're trying to get this data, the horses want to look to the door. Um, and so it sometimes takes time to get the data because the horse wants to look out. Well, as soon as we started with the pads, the horses stopped trying to even look at the door. They were very happy to be with us here. And this horse showed us the typical signs that we see with horses. But the thing that was so fascinating was we put this horse on pods and she just yawned like three or four huge yawns that had not happened with the pads. And of course we were doing a, a little trial. So we took her off the pad, pods and then repeated and no more yawns. So it happened once. And this is the only picture I got of it because it was unexpected. You know, the horse had been fine. We hadn't seen anything like that. So there's something different about the pods being air filled. They're seven inch, half inch domes and they're air filled and they have little bumps on them. There's something different about the pods in terms of what happens. And so here I've gone to purple pods. If anybody can't see a horse standing on purple pods, just pop it in the chat. But I think I can just progress through my photos. So you can see they have little bumps on them. Um, and I typically aim for the third row of dots. So one, two, three with the toe of the horse. So I pick the foot up and I hold it by the cannon bone and I lower it toward the pod. And I, a lot of times I'll actually have two hands on the cannon or cannon bone and fetlock down low. And so I just kind of aim the toe toward the pod. And there's a lot of horses that don't have uh, mid range in their leg. They can bring it all the way up or put it all the way down, but they don't have a gradual lowering of the foot. They can't let it go. It's a long story, but um, so you have to be aware that sometimes the horse will come halfway down and then the foot's going to the ground and you're not going to stop it and you don't try and it doesn't matter. It lands where it lands. If it lands on the pod, great. If it doesn't land on the pod, you get a do over. And I, I never get upset about it. It's just interesting because sometimes it'll come down where you started and sometimes it won't. But when I pick up the foot, I'll, I'll drop the pod into the print of the foot where it was and then lower the foot down. And here you can see on this horse, the horse wound up what I call toe loading. So here's the pod bulging out the back, right? And here's the toe really digging into the ground. And um, horses will stand like this and be really happy. And so we've increased pressure because it's air filled. When you squish anything air filled, think balloon, you increase the pressure where the air has gone to. And so we know that we have an increase of pressure back here, but this horse was very comfortable. In fact, this was a really interesting horse that this horse had a serious, serious injury on this left front, cut to the bone in the upper arm. Long story, took a year to heal, yada, yada. And when we'd done pads the month before and I came back again, I started with pads and then we moved to pods. And so this is the uninjured leg, the right front. And look at how much she drove that toe into the ground. And you can see how the pod, and I like to work on, a, on an arena or soft surface because then the pods can slide with the pressure. And you can see that she didn't start like that on the pod, but she went into this really extreme toe loading. And here she starts to go into a heel load. So you can see the pod is bulging in the front. And um, here she is. Um, and I'll zoom in a bit and here is the scar that remained and it was a horrendous wound. Um, um, but here she is now. Now she's gone laterally on the right front and the pods bulging to the inside. And here you can see that the foot's a bit turned out and she's the angle of the leg. So it's not about being perfect to the pods. It's about noticing how the foot lands on that pod each time. And each time is another piece of information for that horse. And with offers, and she would go for a walk in between, come back, we'd do it again. Again, you can see like she's just slid right off of it to, to the um, outside there. And you can see where her head is, right? and her sternal line is fairly straight. And again, here's that scar, it was huge. Um, but you can see how this leg's a bit turned out. This one, she's standing on a bit more. 
Um, but each time <laughs> she's gaining information from that pod. And so I don't worry about how the foot lands on the pod. And now look, this is the same horse. She went for a walk, she comes back and she's completely switched and she's completely toe loading on the left front and almost what I call a straight load on the right front. Um, we're not on the third row of dots, we're on the what, one, two, three, four, fifth row. So she wasn't quite centered on the pod. No problem, doesn't matter. But we can see that the load is much more evenly distributed on this right front and we can see this, like we can't even see the toe, it's so far into the ground. And we got the pod bulging here out the back. The same horse, just the next time I offered her the pods. And again, you can see that, oops. Um, and then this, I don't, I'm not sure what this video, it might be slow motion. Because now, this was the next time, and she's almost even on the two feet. And it's simply by, you know, picking up the leg, drop the pod where the foot was into the print, right? Taking the leg, lowering it down, aiming for the third row of dots, wherever it winds up, it winds up, not being worried about it, okay? Let her go for a walk, come back, do it again. And the horses change. Uh, um, and the expedient, yeah, happy medium. Um, and each time I go, I aim for the same place, but it doesn't always wind up in the same place. And, it, and it's just, that's the thing you have to really not worry about is where the foot winds up, just offering, okay? So I can, this is just a still shot and just look at how much more even. Obviously I'm not at the third row, I'm a little toward the, to the higher up. So she's a little more to the back of the pod at that point. Um, and there's no toe loading here. If anything, there's a little bit of heel loading. Um, just another, yeah, okay. Look at how much more even she is on the two pods. And it's just by offering and letting her go for a walk and coming back and offering again, okay? And you can see now her, oops, ignore that, um, that her head is quite straight in the middle, that, Let's see if I can blow this up a little bit. You know, I mean, our legs are coming down quite straight. Remember how much that other foot was sliding out? There's a little bit more, little bit of that turnout here in this leg, right? But so much more even. Uh, let's see if that's, yep. And that's, a, that's in another place in the arena. So that's yet another uh, offer. Um, here's another horse on pods. The color of the pods doesn't matter. The, all the pods are the same. They just come in different colors. They're actually the colors that we use to choose the colors for the surefoot pads. In the end, the bright, <laughs> simple colors. Um, and you can see this horse, the foot has slipped back and you can see how the pod is bulging up and actually lifting up off the ground a little bit. So more to the heel on this left front more to the lateral toes. So if we think about that clock again, 12 o'clock being middle, this horse has gone off to mm, two o'clock. And we can see how the pod's bulging up here back at um, about eight, seven to eight. Okay, another offer, another moment. Um, now we can see how this foot, which was slipping off before, is much more even. Okay, and this one's gone back to the heel a bit. Same horse, did it again, totally different. Now we're more medial <laughs> and the pod's bulging and you can see where it was. You can see here's the print of the pod on the soil, right? And so his foot, when they, when they step on it, the foot will slide and the pod will give and it'll kind of roll and bulge up. And that's what you're seeing is that we started out in one place, but the way the weight came down onto it, we wound up somewhere else. Um, and again here, this is more toward the heel on the left front. All right, here's um, back feet, we've got a tail. <laughs> and we can see this is actually a really nice even load. Um, it's one, two, three, you know, I aim for, this is about the fourth row of dots, smaller foot. But what you can see here is how the weight is distributed quite evenly around the left hind. And clearly, look at where the pod started. Here's the impression of the pod on the soil, right? So we started out with it being, all, oops, sorry, come back. Started out with it being 
you know, flat on the ground. And then as he shifted into his heel, it just rolled this pod right up on the front. And so the foot landed on the pod and then the weight came to the heel and the heel slid back. And you can see how that foot is further back than the other one. And then the pod just bulges up. And so it's, um, I don't know if I have any um, video of that slide, which I might, I'm just gonna keep looking here. Again, look at the evenness of this left hind. You know, is it perfectly even? No, is the ground perfectly level? No, um, it, but it's still quite even compared to the right hind. Let's see if I have any video of this. It's just another angle. Oh, so um, here we've done it again, right? And so now what he's done is he's slid the foot so that it's supporting the back of the foot and pushing up and this one again is slid back and again you can see where the impression of the pod was here um, this one uh, i'm not sure if his back foot was further back and so i simply started with it further back oh same back feet did it again totally different now we're toe loading on that right hind and now we've got the pod bulging out the back and on the left hind we've slid a tiny bit right because you can see where the pod was, see the rings? You can see where the pod was, and he, he, sometimes they even drag the whole thing. Okay, but this is the impression of where the pod was. This is where we wind up. Look at the toe loading here on the right hind. So it's the opposite of what we just saw. Same horse, within five minutes, maybe less. Um, he went for a walk, came back, I did it again. He's totally changed. So there's something about the pods having that ability to yield to the pressure of the load, the way the foot's loading onto it. And this is different again, right? Now he's just resting his toe on it. So you can see he's barely putting any pressure there and he slid back and heel loaded the left hind. And I, I mean, all of this is observation. All of this is just data points that I just file in my brain. I don't really get concerned about, oh, that's good or bad. There's no judgment about it. It's just observation. And as you can see now, he's really straight loaded on the right hind and just resting his toe on the left. And, and so it's just another uh, choice. And so he popped off of it, right? He rolled the pot up and then is standing on his right hind, rested his toe, he was mounted. So then we did four pods. Now four pods is um, so not something you just run out and do. Um, a lot of horses I'll do a pair of pads, either front or back, and then a pair of pods. Um, there are very few horses, but I have seen them. Very, very few horses that in the first session, they're on four pods. And the one case, I mean, I'm talking less than a handful. Um, and the one horse that I can think of most is, uh, was a racehorse and it was in Florida and I went down and this thing, he was so amazing in his balance. He could stand on four pods, very first session, totally balanced, but he would shorten his neck. And I just showed the trainer how to lengthen the horse's neck. And when he took him to the race the next time, he just spent a little time lengthening his neck and the horse won his next race. So his balance was great but he was shortening his neck and that was what was hampering his performance. But he was so amazing and incredibly balanced and could stand on four pods, like centered, like so chill. Um, I have video, but I have to dig it out. It's quite old. Um, but here you can see, now we have a nice straight load right hind, resting the toe left hind, slid medial right front, slid back left front, so we've kind of got this diagonal of going toward a heel load here, resting a toe and right front. Um, and of course, as you can see, I have the rider on while I'm doing this, but this is a horse that um, I've worked with for a couple of years. So he was very familiar with pads. Um, and so it was no, not, nothing um, surprising to him to go to pods. Okay, and now you just, it's just another angle. We can see that he side slipped a little bit here on the left front, we see this bulge. Heel slipped a little right front, heel slipped right hind, uh, probably a little lateral slip left hind. This is the back feet again, just another angle. And, and so it's just, you know, I mean, sometimes they don't even land on the pot at all. They just step sideways. Um, 
but it's fascinating to watch them. Yep, this is another another time, and he's more square. Uh, here's a little video. And it's, you know, the same kind of thing that we see with the pads, the swaying, licking and chewing, the soft face, the listening ears. Uh, that's just two seconds, so that's not going anywhere. Okay, let's see what this one does. So um, if you have any questions, just type them in the chat. Um, uh, yes, you can stack pods on a pad. Um, let me see it. Let me just kind of jump back here. and Oh, yeah, here. So yes, you can. Can you see this? It's, it's uh, medium pads with a pink pod. If you cannot see that, I'll redo my screen share. Um, but yes, you can stack a pod on a pad. Um, and again, look at this horse. You can see that the load is actually fairly even. And you can also see that the impression of how much he's sinking into that medium pad there. Um, just an angle from the front. It's got a little bulge behind, a little bit of a toe load there. Um, he's bent that knee a little bit. He might be about to walk off. Um, nope, he's not. He's actually chosen that. I don't remember this horse. Um, this has been a while ago. Um, but he's, you know, gone more to the toe, lifted the heel a little bit. We can see that he's bent the knee slightly. So he's taken some weight off that foot. And he's clearly put a lot of weight onto this one. I don't know if I have any video. It's a different horse. And so um, I don't have a full shot of this horse, but what you can see is the way this leg's coming down. We can guess that this foot is not underneath the point of the shoulder. And it even looks like this leg might be coming in a little bit as well. Okay, just a view from the side. Um, here's what I would call a straight load. You can see just the way the pot is bulging, how even this little sort of tire bulge all the way around, how even it is. And here you can see that we started out with the pod flat and the horse slid the foot and rolled the pod uh, to about four o'clock. Oh, that's our, our friend there. That was, um, so here's a horse that he just went right into toe loading, but, and, and you'll, you'll see this with horses that um, they're not off of it. They're still getting something out of the pressure of the pod, the push of the pod up into the foot in just this little back heel corner here. And again with the other one. And so I'll just kind of check with my foot and see, you know, are they really standing on the pod? Will it pop out if I just tap it? Um, and if not, I leave it. Um, they're getting something out of this, even though it doesn't look like much. Uh, picture, I, I don't know if I can rotate the picture without messing. Through. Oh yeah, I can. There we go. Okay, so here, whoop, too big. Again, this is a quite even load. We've gone a little bit to the front edge of the pod, but you look at the weight distribution around it, it looks quite symmetrical. And here we've slid back. This is where the pod started and we've rolled back. All right, so we have a question here. What signs, oh, prompts me to change from pad to a pod. Um, the, the horses need to be comfortable with pads. And then sometimes I just want to offer them something completely different because it's air filled and it pushes up into the, you know, the sole of the foot, bottom of the foot. It's completely different. Um, and I've had some horses where I had one in particular that was a really interesting story. Um, it was a hunter and um, the horse had, had broke its jaw and I can't remember how that happened, but um, it was a really conscientious owner. She was, she was really upset because the horse had recovered from the injury, but the horse never recovered its movement. Um, and so Greg Best actually sent her to me. Um, I was doing an um, a expo up in Massachusetts at the um, Equine Affair. And so she was one of my demo riders. And, it, you know, I think I only had a half an hour for the demo, but it was so obvious with this horse that I offered her pads, immediate took to it. You could see immediate relief. And it just was like, you know what? I'm just gonna go to pods. And I, she was totally relaxed about it, totally comfortable, but it changed everything. And so um, you, if you have watched Jillian Kreinbring's webinar, if you have not, I highly recommend you go watch that one. The hyoid bone is up here. We have one as well. Um, there's the tongue attachment. 
And then there's so many muscles that attach the jaw, the TMJ, the first, second cervical, the skull, and there's muscles that go down and attach to the, the sternum and inside the shoulder. And so I know that there's a connection from the foot all the way up into the jaw through the hyoid. And so I put her on pods and that horse, it was like, I just, she went to heaven. Um, she was so chill. And I mean, it's, this is a noisy expo, through, you know, 300 people in the audience. And you could just see, it was like, she just melted. And um, the owner cried. She said she had her, her horse came back to her. It was amazing. But it was, it was just the obvious thing to do. Um, you know, so much of this is just uh, ex experiment, practice. That's why we call it practitioners. Um, because you're always practicing, you're never finished in your learning. And it's just, you know, I mean, the worst that can happen is the horse says, no, I don't want a pod, right? And if we honor that as the first rule, listen to the horse, and you go to do a pod, and they're like, well, no, I don't want to do that. It's fine. You know, you don't do it. Maybe you come back another day. Um, but um, when, I'm, when I've seen a horse on a pad, and I'm starting to watch the way they load, and I see that they either have, like, say they have a, a medial load or it looks like they're going to their heel. And I want to bring greater awareness to the horse about how he's actually habitually loading that foot. So I'm just going to stop my screen share for a second. Um, you know, so like if he's always coming down and hitting on the outside of his foot every time he walks, you can do all the shoeing and trimming and everything that you want, but if he's not conscious of that pattern, he just keeps doing it. And then the pads are gonna to yield to that pressure. So they're gonna even out the weight distribution and they're gonna yield and they may make some change. But with the pods, when the horse does that, the pod slips. And so that's why you want it on like a sandy surface or something like that, because you don't want it to slip too fast, you know, pop out from underneath them. But as that load's coming down, that pod starts rolling up and shifting. And you'll literally see horses go, wait a second, what's my foot doing, right? Because it's not staying still. It's moving because the pod starts to give to that pressure. So let me go back to a picture here. I wonder if I have a video. Um, and so it's, it's another level of awareness that the horse, oh yeah, um, well this is, this is a, that's a different, let's see what we got here. Um, when they feel that pod shift, and so it's slow, um, and you can see this horse here, she's toe loading, right, on her left front, quite strongly toe loading, um, and so that's already slid. So, you know, typically by the time I get to step back and take a video or a photograph, however that foot's gonna slip has already happened. So it's, um, you know, it's done. And it's not like I can catch that slide um, because it happens almost as soon as the foot comes down, if it comes down on the edge, on the side like that, and it has a load and the pod just rolls, it's gonna happen within, you know, the first second or two. So it's not, that's not when I'm filming. I'm usually filming after I um, uh, got her on the pods. But here you can see toe, toe load, left front, heel load, right front. Um, uh, but we see the same kind of relaxation with horses. Um, again, going back to that first picture, sometimes we'll see yawning. Look, she's got her eyes. She's totally, totally chilled there. Um, and she's got that very definite toe load, heel load. Right? Um, here we can just see from the side, I'll just blow this up a little bit. You can see how much that, that her toe, you can see how the toe weight's going. And now she has that. And, you know, it's interesting because talking to Dr. Taylor, using the physio pad on top of an x-ray block to see how the horse wants to line up their foot for comfort. Um, this reminds me, I hadn't seen this picture since I've had Dr. Taylor, but it reminds me of that because basically she's doing the same thing. Of If we look at the line of this foot now, she's kind of lined up her pasture into her coffin and um, now, you know, she's got this support at the back of her heel, um, just helping her foot be that way. So it, um, just kind of interesting in light of some of the other webinars. These are old pictures. Um, and here you can see how she slipped back to her heel and you get that big bulge of the pod in front. Um, same thing there. Oh, now it's changed, right? So now we have heel load left front and actually a pretty nice straight load. Look at the evenness 
here throughout, right? And this is where the pod started. And so that's what, you know, I, I don't have the video of actually the pod sliding, but you can tell that it did because as she went into her heel, it rolled it right up because this is where we started. And basically I pick up the foot, I look at where the, the footprint was, I drop the pod into that print, and then I aim for that. Um, and it's, it's a lot of times that it does not happen. But now look at how much more even both feet are. Is it perfect? No. But is it more even? Yes. And this is what we see consistently, is that after a couple of, um, yes, Carol, that's exactly right, is that the more I use the pods, the more balanced the load becomes. Because the pods yield to the pressure and slide a little bit, the horses literally, you'll see their foot starts to slide and they're like, whoa, whoa, what's happening? You know, where's my foot going? And then they'll be, you can see that they're totally relaxed about it. And that's why they need to be familiar with pads first. So that they're relaxed about the process. If something slides or rolls, it's, it's no big deal. But then, oh, I do have a video. We, they, they wind up with a more even load. It's really quite amazing. Um, and I've seen it so consistently that just, just trialing it, just offering. And then you'll see, um, I don't know about this video because I don't remember this video, but I have one where it was a horse really high low and you can just watch the pasterns as they start to yield and the horse is experimenting and the pasture, one pastern lowers and then the other lowers. Um, and now she's on pads behind with pods in front, right? Remember that toe load that we had on that left front? No, now we have a heel load. Um, and so it's just, it's just uh, another way to get their attention uh, about how they're standing. You know, um, we just don't even consider that how much we have habit. Oh, here's that video of the pastures. I was, uh, was that the video? Yep, here we go. Um, we're not gonna look at the feet, okay? We're not gonna look at the hairline. I wasn't there to trim the horse. I was there to do surefoot. Um, and just watch how much, see the, the right pastern lower? And so he's unloaded the left front and then he switches. And he loads the left front, unloads the right. And he just goes back and forth like that. But this horse, I don't know if I have a picture of how he started out on pods. Let me just, uh, but he just kept going back and forth and back and forth with shifting the weight from one foot to the other. Yeah, this is, this is not even the extreme of how he started heel toe. Um, it was even, I have another picture of him somewhere and it was even more extreme than that. Let's just rotate that picture. So yeah, I mean, oops, wrong way. I'll just keep going. Hope I don't make you dizzy. Um, it's a little fuzzy. So we'll just, there we go. That's better. Um, this, oh, why is that not, hang on. I'm going to stop my screen share and then start it again. Um, and it's very different from the pads because it's air filled, so it pushes up. And, uh, oh, this is a little video. But you can see actually that at this point we're a little, we're fairly even, but um, just the experimenting. And please excuse the camera operator. Oh yeah, see that slide there? I'm gonna pull that back. That was awesome. Um, so watch the right front. It's on the, on the left side of your screen. I come around to the side and then right there, you see how the horse loaded the lateral side of the foot and the pod rolls medial, right? I'll just back that up and do that again there, right? We don't have full weight on that pod right now. As the weight comes down, see how the pod gives and then see, you can see how it rolled off the surface right here. I'll just do it one more time. And that's the beauty is that they just have that little roll. So the surface is not fixed. Um, the pads will not roll. I'll just let it play now. Um, and so it just, a, it's a very different level of awareness for the horses. Um, but again, you know, if they have to be comfortable with the pads because if you put them on pods and they have a little roll like that, um, that could make them very nervous. You would never start with an anxious horse on pods, okay? They've gotta be easily able to put the foot on a pad. Uh, yeah, it, it is cool, it's really cool. Um, 
but you can see how this horse is just experimenting with that load coming down and um, you know you can see a bit of yeah that's the camera person making you sick <laughs> just backing up here a bit to get kind of a full I don't even know where this is oh I know where this is um, a, a better view and and you can see how you know here's the point of the shoulder and um, going back to Dennis's talk about confirmation versus posture um, you know, you can see that that leg wants to turn out a little bit and it's not really underneath the point of the shoulder. And you can see how the head was organized actually right there over that left front. Oops, oh, come on, let me go forward. So just another example, okay. And the way that support now is at the back of the foot. Just came off, right, and how that's changed. See if I can turn this picture. Right, and you can see how this heel is slid off to seven o'clock, um, and we get the bulge. And so you, it's nice on the photographs. You can actually see how the where the mark was from the pod, um, and so you can see where it's gone. Um, let me just see if I've got. Uh, this is a therapeutic riding pony. Um, and we did a spa day with him and you can see he's just so happy. He's my new poster child for pods. Um, but a nice even load throughout, right? Again, a fairly even load. Okay. And so, you know, I'm not here to judge angles and feet or any of those things. I'm just here to talk about, you know, how can you use pods to help bring awareness and that's really what we're trying to do. Are the hard pads the only ones that make imprints? Um, oh, somebody asked, are the hard pads the only ones that make imprints? So the only one that makes imprints that's like a lasting imprint, you depend, if it's cold and, and a horse stands on a soft pad long enough, I, I have some pictures of that on the Surefoot Equine you, uh, website. You'll see an imprint on the soft. Um, you have to be careful if you let a horse stand on the soft pad for a, a significant period of time because that the colored top will actually kind of fold in around the foot a little bit and you want to make sure that it doesn't stick to the foot when the horse walks off. Um, so that's if you're leaving them for a while. Um, so other pads can, can, and like the firm pads, if it's colder, you'll see, you'll see it, but the impression pad is kind of the consistent and it doesn't have the lateral give that the other pads have. So you're looking at a more true um, picture because if you have lateral give, then the horse might be standing on the pad and swaying and the imprint that you're going to see is not going to be as true, if you will, because of it, right? So that's one of the things is that the hard pad and the physio pad has an inch of hard. So it will also give you an impression of the foot. Um, so yeah, it's, it's the trueness of the imprint that we're kind of looking at with the hard pad. So toe heel, right? Toe heel. Oh, this is Bob. <laughs> And uh, he's on four pods, okay, but he's got a, a leg going in a different direction, right? He's rolled back on his right hind. Um, he's just on the inside on the left hind. Uh, he's back on the <laughs> seven o'clock on the right front and a big 12 o'clock on the left front. But he loved the pods. And um, this horse, we did a webinar with um, Robin on wrapping and she gave us an update on Bob. He continues to improve and they did pads with him again because he doesn't see the pads frequently um, and he's still improving. Okay, so I have a question from Dr. Mole. Have you ever related the fact that some horses stand on pods unloading the heels and the presence of Palmer foot pain? Um, no, Sybil, because I'm not a vet or a farrier. Um, so I stay within my, my rails. I'm a riding instructor and I do a lot of observation um, and I'm sure that someone with more credentials than me could make that assessment. Um, sometimes horses with this kind of problem used to put a lot of their heels in the stall and maybe they, yeah. It would be very interesting, Sybil, very interesting. And maybe there's somebody out there that would like to do a little study of looking at how horses load and then looking at, you know, doing an x-ray and seeing how, what it looks like, um, or assessing the horse to determine um, heel pain. Um, and that's where, you know, it's, I mean, one of the reasons I'm doing all these webinars is so that I can learn more about the foot and about Palmer angle and all those things, because 
you know, when I started this, I was just looking at feet and I'm going, you know, I don't, I don't really know much about feet. I just know that they're really important in a balanced foot. So I have a working knowledge, if you will, of how important it is to have a balanced foot. But I, I don't have the training um, to assess heel pain um, or anything like that. Um, and so the more I do this, though, the more I was like, I need to learn more about the foot because that is what I'm looking at over and over and over. Um, and so uh, that's actually a big reason behind all the webinars is so that I can learn more. Um, and I think you're right. I think that we, there would be, it would be an, not so difficult study, actually a fairly easy study without a large number of courses to look at how, you know, get them used to pads and then put them on pods and look at how they stand on pods and assess their foot. But the fascinating thing is how rapidly they change um, given the choice, you know, right? So yeah, he still rolls off and look at how much he rolled off. So here's the print of the pod here and there's where his foot wound up. And the, the right hind on Bob was the difficult foot to pick up. And he actually tried to kick me with that leg. Um, so I knew that he was really not happy on that leg. But, you know, he's starting to get a bit more even. Um, there it's really toe loading. This is another horse. And I'll just play this little video because this was a horse when I started, I couldn't pick up his left hind foot. And in three days, not only could I pick up his, his all of his feet, um, but you can see him going, this is actually a firm pad underneath the right hind. Um, don't worry about the color, should be green. Um, and you can see him just experimenting with loading and unloading this left hind, which literally you couldn't pick up when I started. Um, yeah, actually I could ask them. Um, that's not a bad idea. Um, and I know I have somebody else I can ask too. <laughs> There's so much to be done. <laughs> Right, again, toe, really look at how deep the toes have gone in and how much the pod is bulging behind, right? Um, so you can use them and then look at the change. Um, look at the change, right? Oops, so I'll go back to the first one. There's the first one where we got both toes dug in, right? Then a heel toe, is that a reverse heel? No, it's right heel down. Heel, heels, but straight load on left, okay? Heel on right, straight load on left, and that's the end of that. But that was just, you know, in a couple of minutes, just offering the horses the opportunity. And so that's, um, you know, you don't have to do all four feet. You can do one foot. You can see I've got the pod here next to the foot. So when I would pick up that foot, I would just take my foot, tap that pod into place so that it's gonna be in the print. Then we've switched, right? Um, and that's my starting point is, where's the foot before I pick it up? And that's where I wanna put the pods. And this horse here, I don't have it in this talk, but I have pictures of him where he was so sucked in here, you could see this really sharp line. And then after we did the pads and pods, this all, his muzzle smoothed out like crazy. So, pods in front and behind, you can use either, you can mix and match with pads, you can stack pods on pads. This is a like perfect straight load, right? It's just coming right down and you can see how even the load is all the way around the foot. And that's, if there was an ideal, that's my ideal, that really nice straight load. There's a toe heel. Uh, there's a video that's sideways, but we'll just play it. Um, this looks like somebody else is, uh, somebody that we've already seen. Yep, just, right? And they just step off. And that's not uncommon that they'll just lift one foot off and stay on another foot for a while. Not uncommon at all. Uh, all right, so if, if anybody has any more questions, I'm gonna unshare my screen here. Um, let's see, I think I've asked, answered all the questions that some, everybody's come in with. But it would be awesome for someone to do a study about um, Palmer angle and looking at how horses stand on pods. But again, they change so quick. You'd have to be recording each trial on the pod to see what they do and see what they choose. Um, but I think it just gives them an opportunity to find comfort. Um, and again, that's how soon I introduce a horse to pods. Bob, it was on his third day. We'd been working with him for three days. Same with Shiner, it was the third day 
Um, so typically I've been doing a few sessions with a horse if they're at a clinic with me the third or fourth day. Um, if I was working with a horse on my own, I, I, I just make sure they're really comfortable, easy to place on pads, understand pads before you go to pods. Um, uh, you know, I've been doing this a long time, so I, I, my technique is quite good, but you're going to find yourself kind of trying to figure out how do I hold the leg? How do I get the pot into place? <laughs> uh, oh, oh, Bob. Yes, I need to talk about Bob, Bob Belker. Um, they had a really severe thunderstorm the day we were supposed to do Bob's webinar. I got a text from Bob today. He is still without power, and now he's getting worried about water for his horses. Um, so once he has power, we're not even going to talk about a date until he has power. And once he has power and he's been able to put his life back together, um, we'll schedule him. Even if I have to do two in one day, I'll make sure that we get Bob back. Um, so just send him some positive energy there and hope his electricity gets turned back on soon. That was Cristobal, the, the storm that went through and it went straight north. Um, and I thought it went through Wisconsin to Lake Superior, but obviously Michigan got hit pretty hard. So um, just, just send him a little positive energy that he gets his electricity back soon. And um, I just wanna thank everybody for joining me. This, it's great, I love doing Surefoot Fridays. Um, it's really fun and, and um, if you have particular topics that you'd like me to talk about, just pop me an email at wendy at wendymurdoch.com and I'll see what I can do about making sure I address your questions. Uh, remember that all of the webinars are on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. So if you subscribe to that, you'll get notified. And the surefootequine.com website's up. And so if you don't get the email for signing up for the webinars and next week's guests are all lined up already, um, I have Sharon Wilsey coming back on Monday. Yet again, we love getting together. It's really fun. Um, but you can always register through the website on the calendar. You just click on the calendar. It'll pop up a box. Click on that box. And in the text, there's the register link. So thanks again. Have a fabulous weekend. It's a gorgeous day here in Virginia. I'm going to head out to my garden. Um, if you didn't see what I posted on my personal page on Facebook today, there was a a uh, six foot black snake in my apple tree um, about mm, half an hour after I finished cleaning up around the base of the apple tree. So not sure if he was there while I was cleaning, um, but it was pretty cool to see him. Yesterday was a turtle laying an egg, so <laughs> you never know what's going to happen in my garden. All right, see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.